Hi, good morning. We are reading The Mystery of History, Volume 4, but we also are putting in a little bit of the science in the Age of Reason um, because we want to know kind of also the science that was going on at the same time. So today in Mystery of History, we're on page 25. We're just going to read a little bit of that and then switch over to Science in the Age of Reason and pick up a couple of the things that were going on in science. Okay, Voltaire and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, leaders of the Enlightenment. Mrs. Hobart says, let's begin our lesson by defining the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was a movement of the 1700s. This says 18th century. But I don't like to say it that way because that makes me think 1800s and it's a little confusing. So I just say 1700s because that lets me know right when it was. So the Enlightenment during the 1700s, it was a movement when philosophers would look to human reason instead of God to better understand mankind. Now, just to be sure, um... It's fine to reason through the Bible as long as you're asking God for wisdom. It's not fine to try to make sense of the world and life um, without the perspective of God. Um, you can, certainly, if you want to, but you will miss what, Cruz? What will you miss if you're trying to make sense of life without considering God? You'll miss that so... You'll miss all of it. You'll miss the entire reason for you being here because God has a reason for every single person. It has a job for every single person. And if you're reasoning about without the Lord, you will find that you've missed your purpose. Um, <clears throat> okay. It says, This movement wasn't new. Man has always looked for better understanding of himself and the world around him. And he has frequently left God out. But I would say, this is Mrs. Hobart talking, that the philosophers of the Enlightenment were broader in their thinking than others before them. They not only looked to reason and rational thought, that means reasoning for understanding, but they also added to the equation the study of nature, politics, education, law, economics, and matters of the heart. So, in fact, enlightened thinkers did not call themselves philosophers, but rather phil philosophes. The French term was considered a sophisticated expression for students of society who analyzed the evils of humanity and tried to make society better. So they were trying to make society better in all these areas. Let's go over those areas again. Study of nature, politics, education, law, economics and matters of the heart so they were trying to make things better in all areas but without god we might call also call this a form of humanism so humanism that's kind of a a tough subject a i would say a, a hot button issue for me because humanism is technically a religion um in fact our supreme court determined that it was um, they, the, humanism is what is taught in our public schools. You're taught to, that our world exists and there's no mention of God. And God is not considered as a factor. Um, and it's considered that we're the only relevant things. So when you send your child to school, what you're, you're, you're saying you are agreeing that your child will learn humanism and your child will learn about, about the world without God in it. We're not trying to rule your life. We're just throwing in a wise tip. Well, I'm teaching y'all, so. Um, yeah. So a lot of people will say, oh, well, they don't teach religion in school. They certainly do. They teach humanism. And humanism is, this is how the world is, and God isn't in it. That is a religion. It's where, God, it's where man is God, because man is the center of all. And when she said y'all, she didn't mean you, she meant us. Yes. All right. Were the philosophes successful in changing mankind? That's a good question. The answer, I think, depends on your worldview. We'll come back to that, but let's look now 
at the leaders, two leaders of the Enlightenment, Voltaire and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Um, we're going to stop there and, and switch over to, so we're going to, before we dig into Voltaire, we're going to look um, at the science in the age of reason. Get it now? Science in the age of reason, the Enlightenment, using uh -huh. human reasoning. This is the mid-1700s. Um, we're on page 144 with Jan Egenhaus. He was born in the, Netherler ne the Netherlands. That sounds like a German name, Egenhaus. I'm not sure. And he started studying medicine at 16 years old. He got his degree. Wow, that's impressive. And he began practicing medicine in his hometown of Breda or Breda. About nine years after he started, his father died, and he inherited some money, so he decided to travel. He heard about the success of the smallpox inoculation, and he wanted to learn more. He was invited to England by the king's physician. His name was Sir John Pringle. Inoculation was being used there thanks to the efforts of Lady Mary Wortley Montague. We learned about her in Lesson 5. I do not remember her from Lesson 5. It's a long time ago. Uh, let's see here. That's Lesson 1. Uh, lesson 4. Oh, Lady Mary Wortley Montague. I remember her. Okay. She was an English aristocrat, means her family was very important in society, in English society. And she caught smallpox. Okay. So she realized that back in her day, people who got smallpox once they got it, if they survived, they never got it again. So they decided, the physicians decided to take, give them a mild case of smallpox, and they wouldn't have to worry about it anymore. That was their medicine? Um, it's basically kind of like a vaccine today. Um, they would scratch open... They would basically put a, a very small amount. What's the symptom of smallpox? Uh, you get very bad blisters all over your body. Okay. So anyway, back to Jan Egenhaus. Pringle introduced Egan House to another physician. His name was William Watson. He practiced inoculation in London with great success. So Egan House learned everything he was to learn and became very good at it. Eventually, John Pringle learned that Empress Maria Theresa in Austria had heard about inoculation and she wanted it done to her family. Physicians in Austria were against inoculation, but she was convinced that it was the best thing to fight against smallpox. So she asked for a skilled physician from England, and Pringle suggested Egan House. He went to Austria, and the Empress was so thankful for his inoculations that she named him her court physician, and that included a lifetime salary. He ended up living in Austria, meeting and marrying his wife there. He had many duties as the court physician, such as teaching other physicians about how to inoculate against smallpox. His generous salary allowed him money for travel and to perform inoculations all over, it says abroad, meaning outside of Austria. During this time, he invest investigated something ra rather different. He investigated how plants interact with gases, so that's very different from inoculations. He demonstrated that plants produce oxygen, just as Priestley had done, but he also showed that light was required for this. Um, 
he showed that light was necessary for oxygen to be produced, so he's often given credit for discovering photosynthesis. What is photosynthesis? Do you remember? Caleb, can you tell me? Um, it has to do with plants. What is the photosynthesis process in plants? Why? That's close. You need light, you need water. Cruz, what else do you need? Dirt. <laughs> you don't technically need dirt, but there usually is dirt. The plant is usually planted in dirt. Cruz, what else do you need? We need light, we need water. We Kayla, need, put that down. We need, so we need air. We need carbon dioxide, yeah. and we need the most important oxygen. Wait, no, that's air. Chlorophyll. Um, so, this chemical chlorophyll makes photosynthesis po possible. Without it, plants could not turn carbon dioxide wa and water into glucose and oxygen. So, chlorophyll, the plants, the sun is shining on the plant leaves. They're sucking up water in their roots. They're absorbing the carbon dioxide. They're breathing in the carbon dioxide, and they, the chlorophyll is used to turn the water and carbon dioxide into glucose. Now, what is the glucose? What's another word for glucose? Um, another word for glucose. I sugar. love it. Yes, sugar. sugar. It turns it into sugar, which the plant uses for food, and oxygen, which we use to breathe. And the chlorophyll is what makes that green... Um, color in plants. Okay. So he showed that light is necessary for plants to produce oxygen and that they only produce oxygen in their leaves, not in their stems. Mm -mm -mm. A plant's leaves usually have a lot of chlorophyll, so that's where it perform it you know it undergoes photosynthesis. What does chlorophyll do to make photosynthesis possible? It absorbs the energy from the sun. The plants use that energy to force carbon dioxide and water to react to form oxygen and glucose or oxygen and sugar. Water and carbon dioxide do not react when they're in the air. It takes energy to make them react. Interesting. And the chlorophyll in plants absorbs the energy from light and directs it in just the right way to make the carbon dioxide and water react. Chlorophyll doesn't absorb green light. It reflects green light, which is why the parts of the plant are green that have chlorophyll in them. It absorbs all the other colors. Not all plants use chlorophyll to get the job done. There are some plants that don't even have green leaves. Oh, the Japanese maple tree, the crimson king maple that's in our yard. It has purple leaves. They I do. They are red. Um, kind of. Its leaves do photosynthesis quite well. They have, they, they have chlorophyll in them, but they also have other chem chemicals that reflect colors of light. They have chemicals called anthocyanins, anth anthocyanins, sorry, anthocyanins, that reflect red and blue, which makes them look purple. Okay, so it says they have the anthocyanins, but they also have chlorophyll. Okay, Ingenhaus, is that how we say it? I forgot how to say his name. Ingenhaus discovered one other thing about plants. They, in addition to absorbing carbon dioxide, they also emit carbon dioxide when it's dark. Why? Because just like animals and people, they have to use the food that they make for themselves. They use photosynthesis to make their own food. But to get energy, they have to burn it. Just like other living things. When they burn their food, they use up oxygen and make carbon dioxide. 
over the course of their lives, the plants absorb a lot more carbon dioxide than they let out. And they make a lot more oxygen than they use. Nevertheless, there are times, especially when it's dark, that they do use oxygen and emit carbon dioxide. Okay, so photosynthesis requires water, carbon dioxide, and chlorophyll. Chlorophyll. What does chlorophyll do in a, in a plant, Cruz? Chlorophyll. It helps it the plant to... Okay, turn green. It, no, but what does it do? It does reflect the green light, but it absorbs. It helps the plant to absorb what? Oxygen. I mean, carbon dioxide. No, it helps the plant to absorb... Caleb, do you know? I don't want you looking through the pamphlets while I'm talking. In fact, Cruz, put those up. If you're looking through the pamphlets, you're not listening to me. Which is maybe why you're not, you don't know the answer to this question. Either one of you. The sun. The chlorophyll helps the plant to absorb the sun. The plant then uses the energy from the sun to do what? Uses the energy from the sun to emit oxygen. No. It uses the energy from the sun to make two things react. Two things react. Water and carbon dioxide. The water and the carbon dioxide uses the energy from the sun to make the carbon dioxide and the water react. To form what? Once they react, they form what? A plant. Sugar. Glucose and oxygen. Mm -hmm. 